Hello and welcome or welcome back to another episode of The Pilot Principle. The podcast where we take a look at just the first episode of a series, The Pilot, and then it uses to decide if we should watch the entire series. I always stumble over that line. I don't know why I don't change it. Yeah, we'll see. On <laughs> on this episode of The Pilot Principle, we are checking out episode one of Sky Atlantic's eagerly anticipated, I want to say science fiction. Yeah, science fiction series, Dune Prophecy. Set 10,000 years before the birth of Paul Atreides, discover the origins of the Bene Gesserit, the powerful sisterhood whose influence spans across the Imperium. A bit of a pre-warning for you, crew. There is going to be a lot of lore. L-O-R-E slash explanations in this episode. It's kind of unavoidable when you're looking at something with such a chunky backstory slash history slash following. If, for example, I was going to talk about Doctor Who, and I will, if you really want me to, I will. But if I was going to, I couldn't just start at Inkuti Gatwa and then go forward from there. You know, there are so many other nincompoops to talk about. But before we get too bogged down in all of that, the reason that I decided to watch Dune Prophecy is because I quite liked Dune and Dune 2. You know what? I like. I didn't like Dune the first time I watched it, mostly because I didn't really understand what was going on. But when I watched it for the second time at home and could pause and, you know, have subtitles on so that I could actually <laughs> see, then I got into it. And then obviously Dune 2 came out earlier this year and yeah, just kind of digging it. Also, this sounds unrelated, but give me a second. I also really enjoyed The Penguin, the recent series that came out on Sky slash HBO. So I'm wondering if this model is sustainable. Basically the model where we get a TV series spinoff of a movie that sandwiches in between the next movie, you know, essentially keeping the audience distracted for how long it takes for a new movie to come out. And finally, I was also kind of interested to see how accessible this series was going to be as a prequel, specifically for anybody who hadn't watched any of the Dune movies. The Dune Vs. No, that's not a thing. Okay, so <laughs> let's quickly whiz through the nuts and bolts. And by that, I, of course, am talking about the credits. The pilot is titled The Hidden Hand. Great pilot title, can I just say. And the synopsis tells us that on Wallach 9, young Valya Harkonnen makes a promise. 30 years later, Valya faces a threat to her long-awaited plan. We have an episode length of one hour, a series length of six episodes, and you can watch Dune Prophecy on Sky Atlantic in the UK and on HBO in the US of A. The pilot episode was written by Diane Ademu John, and it will come as absolutely no surprise that Ademu John also developed the series for television. Seems to be the trend, but to be honest, I'm not mad at it because that's exactly what I would do if I came up with a fantastic series idea. Now, Ademu John has also written episodes of Empire and The Originals. Real life, science fiction and supernatural, three very different vibes, but I'm all for diversifying your portfolio, so go on with it. The pilot episode was directed by Anna Forrester, and Forrester also directed episodes of Westworld, Jessica Jones and Outlander, another portfolio diversifier. Now, in terms of cast, I did kind of want to do another six degrees of separation thing, but there are sadly just way too many people to talk about and I would be here for hours. So we'll have to wait for the right moment to do another one of those. First on the cast list, we have Emily Watson, who plays Valia Harkonnen. Harkonnen? I think it's Harkonnen, but I'm basically going to get that wrong throughout the entirety of this podcast episode. So just know that I know and move past it. So Watson has been in a bunch of things, including Chernobyl, Apple Tree Yard, and Small Things Like These, which is the new Cillian Murphy movie, which I haven't seen yet. Next, we have Olivia Williams, who plays Tula Harkonnen, Harkonnen and you might recognise Williams as playing Camilla in The Crown. 
Next, we have Travis Fimmel as Desmond Hart. And Fimmel had a long stint on Vikings and recently starred in Boy Swallows Universe. And finally, we have Mark Giuseppe Strong, who plays Emperor Javico Carino. I... <laughs> had to include his middle name in there because I, for some reason, got into the habit of calling him Giuseppe. No, I do not personally know Mark Giuseppe Strong, but (laughs) I don't know. It's just a habit I can't break out of. So in case I slip further on in the episode and I'm just like, and then Giuseppe said, you know exactly who I'm talking about. Right, Giuseppe. (laughs) Mark Strong has also starred in The Penguin, so he clearly loves a series spin-off. He also had a long-running role in the series Temple. The pilot also stars Sarah Sophie Busnina, Jodie May, Josh Houston, Chris Mason and Jade Anuka. Colour us all shock and horrid because Dune Prophecy is not an original piece of work. I know, right? It is actually based on the novel Sisterhood of Dune, written by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson, and the novel Dune by Frank Herbert, neither of which I've read. No, no, sad times. If they're good, let me know and I'll add it to the TBR. What's quite interesting is that Dune was written in 1965 and then 47 years later in 2012, Frank Herbert's son picked up the pen to write Sisterhood of Dune. That's basically a whole other level of generational wealth that I can't quantify as a child of immigrants. So let's move on to the other fact, which is that this is not the first Dune world related TV series. In 2000, we had Frank Herbert's Dune, and in 2003, we had Frank Herbert's Children of Dune. Now, I do believe Frank, no, not Frank, James, James McAvoy starred in one of those two. You can quote me on that. Whew. Okay, take a moment to soak it all in so far, because I'm going to need you to stay locked in as we get into the nitty gritty of this pilot episode. In the meantime, while you're having a moment of reprieve, if you have made it this far, then do make sure to hit follow and do not forget to give a five star rating to the pod, especially if you have been listening for a while now. As always, much appreciated. I mean, I do all of this for fun, but even I'm not immune to a shot of endorphins when I get a new follower, a five star rating or a cheeky comment. Okay, enough about me. Let's... (laughs) move on to talking about the first 10 minutes of ah oh crap it's not called the hand of god is it did i make that up i did make that up didn't i it's called the hidden hand why the first 10 minutes you wonder with bated breath well crew that is because much like the first page of a novel one can always tell in those opening 10 minutes if they are going to enjoy the series after all the first 10 minutes is what prepares us for the journey ahead And the first 10 minutes of The Hidden Hand goes like this. We begin with a bit of a history lesson and we learn how humans rose up against thinking machines. The war and subsequent victory was led by an Atreides while a Harkonnen deserted the fight, leaving him and his family to be branded as cowards and banished. Now, we are told all of this by Valia Harkonnen in voiceover. And Valia is the granddaughter of the man who deserted the fight. She believes that the history spun by the Atreides is a lie and she sets out to change it. Valia chooses to leave her family behind and journeys to Wallach 9, where she decides to join the sisterhood. The Sisterhood is run by Raquel Berto Enirol and she is the first mother superior who trained women to work as truthsayers. Truthsayers were assigned to the great houses to help them discern the liars among them. However, Mother Superior is working on a secret project which is to breed better leaders. And in order to do that, she built a genetic archive to help bring about specific unions between the great houses to cultivate rulers the sisterhood could control. This manipulation is seen as heresy by some in the sisterhood. On her deathbed, Mother Superior has a vision. She then tasks Valga, who agrees with her mission of cultivating the ultimate leader, 
with growing the sisterhood and protecting that mission at all costs. Which is why when Raquel's daughter, Dorothea, who leads the heretics, goes to destroy the genetic archive, Valia stops her. And by stops her, I mean she uses a new power she's been working on, the voice, to make Dorothea stab herself in the neck when she refuses to bend the knee to Valia. And that, well, that's the first 13 minutes. I know, I know, it was a lot. In case you didn't get all of that, here are some highlights. Valia Harkonnen leaves her disgraced family and joins a sisterhood of truthsayers assigned to great families with their own agenda. Valia then kills a sister to protect Mother Superior's vision, get a leader they can control on the throne. There is also something coming which will derail the mission. Tiran Arafel, a reckoning, a holy judgment brought on by a tyrant. So to prepare, Valia decides to get a sister on the throne. Now, as an intro, it's a lot. I had to watch it twice to really deep it, which tracks. As I said, I had to watch (laughs) Dune twice in order to understand it. However, I will say with this opening 10 minutes, it really sets the scene for political intrigue. You kind of get the idea that there's going to be a lot of truth manipulation going on. And so we're already thinking, trust no one. Also, I think it's quite good to see early on that people are willing to kill for what they believe in. For us, the audience, it means that no one is safe and that we're going to be kept on our toes waiting for the next death that will move the right piece across the board depending on who's playing. Looking at character, we only really get to know one person really well in the pilot episode and that is of course Valia Harkonnen. (laughs) Valia is a headstrong, obstinate girl who turns into a headstrong, obstinate woman. Because after the first 10 minutes where we see a young Valia Harkonnen, the episode then fast forwards 30 years and we see Valia as the new Mother Superior in succession of Raquel, Berto, Annie Rule. From the pilot episode, we see that Valia's belief is unshakable and as such, She wants absolute obedience from those around her in the sisterhood, which could be a bit of a problem if she starts making events fit her version of truth. It's also worth noting that Valia did not come to Wallach 9 alone. I think it's Wallach. Walch, Wal, Wal, Wallach? (laughs) Walcher? I kind of want to say Walcher, but that's not it. I'm going to stick with Wallach. What was I saying? Yes, she didn't go to the planet alone. She actually went there with her younger sister, Tula. And Tula is her confidant. However, there is something that we can't yet pin down when it comes to Valia and House Harkonnen. As a mother superior, different houses come to ask them for truth says. And in the pilot episode, we see Valia deny House Harkonnen a truth sayer for the fourth time time and when she does she looks visibly affected by the conversation so yeah this makes us really curious about her past so what brought Valia to Wallach 9 and what does she know that makes her think the history books about her grandfather is a lie I touched on it before, but just to reiterate, Valia acts as our guide for the pilot episode through voiceover. But kind of like last week's episode on Say Nothing, we get the sense that she is another narrator that we can't fully trust to tell us the whole truth, which is also kind of ironic considering her whole bag is truth. She's a truth sayer. Also, interestingly, at the very start of the pilot, Valia in voiceover asks us what holds more truth, victory or prophecy? which kind of tells us that the two aren't the same thing. And again, this feeds into the whole, can we trust Valia to accurately depict history and all prophecy? And that's all there is to say thus far about Valia. She does feature quite heavily in the pilot episode, but at the same time, we're not quite getting all of her. She feels reserved and like she's holding all her cards to her chest, even to us, the audience, which I think is really interesting. Right, as there's no other characters to really talk about, I think it's a good idea to break down the sisterhood and the houses mentioned in the pilot episode, just for some context. So very quickly, the sisterhood has in fact grown over the last 30 years under Valia's tutelage 
we meet a group of students with their own various personalities who have <laughs> recently graduated to Acolytes and they will soon be joined by Princess Nez. Valia is very pleased by this as it's been a manipulation years in the making. Okay, on to the houses mentioned. Firstly, on the planet Salus Secundus, homeworld of the Imperial House, we have House Carino. And House Carino is run by Emperor Carino, played by Giuseppe. So <laughs> the Carinos mine dust on a planet called Arrakis, and this is what keeps them as top dogs. Also to mention with the house, they have a truth sayer named Kasha, who is one of Valia's friends from 30 years ago and also believes in the mission that the OG Mother Superior designed. And I don't understand how or why, but she is bonded to the Emperor's daughter, Princess Nez. And so Kasha has been instrumental in convincing Emperor Carino slash Princess Nez to essentially join the sisterhood. So Nez will soon be traveling to Wallach 9 to start training. Next to mention is House Rachaces run by Duke Rachaces and the Duke's son who is like nine is engaged to Princess Nez and this union has been formed because it means that the emperor gets a new fleet to help out stopping attacks on Arrakis and Princess Nez has time to live her life before the Duke's son comes of age and they have to get married. The other houses to kind of mention are House Harkonnen, who of course put in a fourth request recently for a truth sayer, which has been denied. We hear a lot about House Harkonnen. <laughs> Goodness, try saying that one five times fast. We hear a lot about... <laughs> we hear a lot about House Harkonnen throughout the pilot episode but we never really meet anybody from the house except for of course Valia and Tula. Finally to mention is House Atreides who we don't really hear of at all in the episode beyond the history lesson we get at the very top and personally I was surprised that they weren't the imperial house after allegedly leading humans to victory over the thinking machines but a lot can happen in 116 years, so I'm assuming at some point we'll learn what went down. The other two houses mentioned in the pilot episode are House of Varric and House Kumali, but so far they've got nothing to do with nothing. Oh, before we move on, let me quickly touch on Desmond Hart, who is played by Travis Fimmel, who looks like he stepped right off the set of Raised by Wolves. <laughs> in his characterization. So this character definitely gives antagonistic energy from the moment we see him. Hart did 12 tours in Arrakis and was the only survivor of a recent Fremen attack. Fremen are a culture of people who live on Arrakis, if I've got that correct from the Dune movies. <laughs> Following said attack, Hart has come to Seleucus Secundus and has asked the Emperor to stay on his planet and to get a job under his guard or something. But don't feel too bad for him yet because Hart does in fact go on to prove himself as an antagonist by being a manipulator and a murderer later on in this episode. And yes, that kind of does sound exactly like what Valia did 30 years ago, but it's different. Okay, it's different and we'll get to why very soon. Now it is time for a quick interlude to see what my film and TV life is looking like beyond the pilot principle, starting as always with the books. And you and I are very pleased to hear that I have finished reading Missing You by Harlan Coben. Ultimately, my thoughts and feelings were correct when I was only halfway through the book and that was just that the main character was really annoying. It was severely overwritten and I would have given it one star, but I think I ended up giving it two out of five. But as we know, I do intend to watch the upcoming Netflix series at the start of January. So <laughs> look out for that compare and contrast. Having put that down, I have now picked up Bride by Ali Hazelwood, which is completely different to Missing You. I haven't read that much thus far, but I can tell you that it is about a vampire and a werewolf. So <laughs> make of that what you will. Moving over to film and there's actually not much to, um, to say. It's a bit embarrassing, really. I've watched Hot Frosty. 
<laughs> my second Christmas movie thus far, and that is the new one on Netflix starring Lacey Chabert. I freaking love Lacey Chabert. She does fantastic Hallmark-esque movies. And she's also one of those actresses that when she cries, I cry. If anybody ever watched Party of Five, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. In other film news, I need to make time to see Gladiator 2, which I will. I will do soon. But I actually have bought tickets to see Wicked, which is unlike me because technically it's not out yet. However, I'm going to go and see it at the BFI IMAX. So I'm very much looking forward to that. I don't think I've seen a movie in IMAX yet, which sounds ridiculous, but my local cinema is like a fiver. So <laughs> the fact that I had to pay £22 for this ticket felt criminal. And finally, over in TV land, I finished watching Mindhunter. <sighs> listen, I already knew that it had been cancelled and I really enjoyed series one. Series two was just a bit of a letdown. It really spiralled with that Atlanta storyline and it just didn't feel like anything was resolved at all. Like where the hell did Agent Smith go? What happened to Dr. Carr? And this is while, oh God, I really can't remember their bloody names. This is while the main two agents were in Atlanta helping out with that case. We just, they just completely lost sight of everything else that was going on and so I thought that was really disappointing um tis a shame that there will be no more but because the second series ended on such a mm, lazy flop for me I'm also not mad at it apparently the reason that it got cancelled is because it was too expensive to produce and to be honest if they kept the plot going at the slow pace of which they made series two then that makes sense but now that Mindhunter is over I have begun watching the OA and I'm currently, I want to say, two episodes deep. And I want to ask you, is it worth it? Should I continue? Because I am not loving it. There is something about that woman, Brit something. She was also um, one of the characters in Don't Tell Me. No, no, no. I know you know it, but don't tell me. The Murder at the End of the World. <laughs> she was also in that. And I think she also created it, if I'm not mistaken. And there's just something about her storytelling that I don't like. It's just, it feels unnecessarily slow. Like, what are you building all of this anticipation and tension towards? Genuine question. So <laughs> let me know. Is it worth it? Fast forwarding along to the end of episode hook, we have three main things that happen. Firstly, Princess Nez goes clubbing because <laughs> apparently on all worlds, there is clubbing and there is drugs. So she goes to a club where she bumps into her sword master, who she kind of has the hots for. They like make eyes while they do some sword training early in the episode. But now outside of the palace, words can turn to action and the two of them hook up. But the most interesting thing is that we learn Kieran, the sword master, his last name is, wait for it, Atreides. Yeah. Didn't see that coming. Anyway, while these two are hooking up, the princess's new betrothed is being murdered by, you guessed it once again, Desmond Hart. And before he murders the child, emphasis on the word child, he says this is all part of the greater good or something to that effect. And then finally, simultaneously, these three things are basically all happening at the same time or within the same 20 minutes. Kasha, who is the truth sayer for House Carino and is bonded to the princess, dies in the same way as the princess's betrothed. Basically, their flesh starts to burn. And I guess they boil from the inside out, question mark. And these images of burning flesh look similar to the vision that the original Mother Superior had on her deathbed about something that is coming to harm the sisterhood, etc. So yeah, it's pretty much all going off at the end of episode hook. In terms of where I think the serial arc is going to go, as well as some series predictions, I mean, undoubtedly, there's going to be some sort of investigation into who killed the Duke's son, and of course, why. If the princess makes it to Wallach 9, will she find friend or foe in the new group of acolytes? And finally, because the Duke's son, who the princess was supposed to be betrothed to and then would 
essentially end up marrying and then producing heirs for. Considering all of that now can't happen, which has to tie into the whole DNA archive to find the ultimate leader that the sisterhood can control. Well, now that that can't happen because the kid is dead, that means that everything that Valia is working towards has suddenly been thrown out of balance. And I believe that she will make crazy shit go down to make everything come back into her version of alignment. Those are my thoughts for a serial arc. Now, in terms of some wild speculation for series predictions, I think that Hart, Desmond Hart, has a family on Arrakis or believes the beliefs of the Fremen on Arrakis, whatever that may be, because he has done 12 tours there. Apparently, most people only do one. Why did you stay so long? What did you learn while you were there? I also think the princess might be pregnant. That might be a bit too tropey, but it does fall in with my next point, which is that the sisterhood, Valia specifically, will learn that they can only control so much and if that's the case, and Valia can't prove herself to be all-knowing, will that cause the sisterhood to divide and create factions like we saw 30 years ago? What will Valia do to regain control? Perhaps somebody will rise up against her. Perhaps that will be her sister Tula. I can't say who would win in that fight, but my money actually might be on Tula. Okay, nearly there, crew. We're almost there. Come on, we can do this. We've gotten this far together. In terms of what made this a particularly strong pilot, in those first 10 minutes, Mother Superior has a vision. And the effects? The camera work? The editing? <laughs> Honestly, I'm full. I am full. My stomach is bursting because it was delicious. Oh God, it was so well done. And it wasn't cheesy either. It felt like we were watching a beautiful experimental short film and it really met the production value of the films, which yeah, great. In fact, I'm going to have to go and check how much it costs each episode to make. Visions aside though, overall the setting, the location, the world that has been built, all of that, fantastic. 10 out of 10. The pilot really goes a long way in immersing us into this world, literally from the first frame. And sure, yeah, don't get me wrong. The story, the structure, the plots being planted. Yeah, they were all great too. But the other stuff mm, really takes your breath away. In terms of what let the pilot down, this is going to be another bit of a nitpicking point for me. That's all I've been doing for the last few episodes, just nitpicking things. So I think there was a lot of cryptic messaging throughout the pilot. Mostly this came through Valia's voiceover, which yes, is on brand, but with the world building taking place, it's just another thing to think about and to decipher while you're trying to learn everyone's names and loyalties and uh, just, just more brain power. Like for example, Valia tells us victory is celebrated in the light, but it is won in the darkness. Okay. <laughs> okay, Valia, sure. And then she says, of course, this line that I quoted earlier, what holds more truth, victory or prophecy? And you know what? Like, honestly, honestly, though, bars, absolute bars. But on the other hand, it, you know, makes you wonder what the voiceover is adding to the story, at least thus far. But again, that's just me nitpicking. Okay, it's almost, almost, almost decision making time. But I wanted to quickly say that I think if you were to walk into this series for the first time without having read or watched anything from the Dune Sphere, then I think that you should be okay. You might be confused by the opening text about being set 10,000 years before the birth of Paul Atreides, but at least you kind of circle back back to understand the link when you find out the sword master's name last name is Atreides. Okay based on everything I have said thus far here is why I think Dune Prophecy might be for you. If you like a bit of world building now it isn't for everybody but some people out there freaking love it then I think you will enjoy the brick by brick labour that has gone into at least the pilot episode. 
Secondly, I think if you really enjoy the cinematography and quality of the films, the recent films, then sure, the series is done to a smaller degree, but it's certainly not lacking and is really just something to look at on screen. And finally, I think if you enjoy political shows, you know, house this, house that, throne this, throne that, succession this, succession that, then I think Doom Prophecy might very well be for you. Now on the flippity flip side, it is a bit slow, just a, just a little bit slow. So if you prefer your shows to be a bit more action packed and just get going, then I'm not saying you're going to fall asleep, but you might not have both eyes open when you're watching Dune Prophecy. Secondly, if you are easily bogged down by a lot of characters, think Game of Thrones, for example, then um, you can persevere but you might also not want to do that. So <laughs> episode one has a lot of setup going on and that will likely continue throughout at least another couple of episodes. So if you're just not ready to go down that route, then don't press play on this. And finally, I think that if you are debating watching the movies first, the new movies, is that's all I can testify to, then I think you should go ahead and do that and press pause on the series. I do think you can watch and possibly enjoy the series without having seen the recent movies. But I think watching the films will prepare you for the heaviness and the lore, L-O-R-E, of the world. I will be giving the hidden hand. <laughs> it's not the hand of God. We know that. Yeah, let's go with the hidden hand. I will be giving the hidden hand a pilot score of four out of five. I think this pilot works as a fantastic setup to the world and the characters and the politics. Also, I think it really cleverly plays into the whole theme that the sisterhood, aka eventually the Bene Gesserits, are all about moving pieces and playing the long game, etc. I'm taking away one point, not just because I ended up giving Say Nothing a five out of five last week, but I'm taking a point away because I think the voiceover, like, is it driving the narrative or is it a narrative device? Is it actually essential or is it a cheat code? Undecided. I, of course, hate myself because I will, in fact, be adding <laughs> June Prophecy to my watch list. No, don't ask me when. Actually, this is being released episodically, so I shall endeavour to tune in every Monday or something. In fact, I will try to keep you posted on each episode with as minimal spoilers as possible in subsequent podcast episodes. No, 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 don't thank me. You are more than welcome. Thanks for joining me this week. Have I convinced you to tune into Dune Prophecy or have I accidentally convinced you to turn it off? You can comment directly on this episode if you are listening on Spotify and if you aren't, well, you can just chat to me over on Instagram and Twitter at Pilot Printable. Next time, I will be reviewing the pilot for Get Millie Black, which is a Channel 4 slash HBO show, I want to say. Either way, if you would like to know more, well, then I will just have to catch you on the next episode. <laughs>